What's going on, buddy? My name is Zellaprint, and welcome back to yet another reaction video. And today we are checking out another SCP video. Today we are checking out SCP-1966. It is by Dr. Bob. And this one caught my attention because it has to do with a body scanner. I'm assuming it's basically one of those uh, metal detectors, but for some reason it's alive. But that's about as far as my guesses go, because literally the opening scene of this is literally in a commercial airliner. So that's why I'm thinking that right away. So it could be very wrong, though. I mean, like I said in some of my previous uh, SCP videos, that not every SCP is bound by the title of itself. It could be something else completely different. So with that guess out of the way, we're going to go ahead and get right into this in three, two, one, boom. Air travel used to be an event. People climbed aboard planes in their best dress, their finest suit, sat in seats with plenty of legroom, and really relished the opportunity to soar through the sky from destination to destination. <clears throat> now, flying has become, ironically, pedestrian. Sure, some people still take it seriously and revel in the miracle of flight, but most treat it the same as riding a Greyhound bus. <coughs> a True. businessman with his carefully packed carry-on and phone loaded with news podcasts to pass the time that is exactly how it feels. Flying is a chore, one he wishes he didn't have to deal with. But sadly, he has no choice. Not if he wants to keep being the most valuable employee at his job, the one who never says no yeah. to a... Uh, fun fact, I do not like flying. Not after what happened a few years ago, but I won't go too much into it. ...quest from the boss. He's garnered a reputation as a real team player, which really means guy who's up for anything the company requests, no matter how boring, annoying, or exhausting. It's gotten him pretty far, and now that he's up for a promotion that would double his salary, he's certainly not going to give up the habit now. So here he is, stepping out of his taxi at the international airport, ready to hop on the longest flight of his life. Did he not take his luggage hours, with him? Non-stop to Australia for a conference. No one else wanted to deal with the jet lag, the leg cramps, the claustrophobia. So, of course, the helpful-to-a-fault businessman volunteered. He rolls his small suitcase, precisely measured to meet the size standards for a carry-on, because he can't risk the airline misplacing his checked bag and stranding him at the conference with no suits, and walks into the airport. He's done this routine dozens of times before, every time pretty much the same. He has it down to a science, as quick and convenient as possible to minimize stress and make the journey go smoothly. He prints his boarding pass, drinks the dregs of his morning coffee, and tosses the cup and heads to the pre-check line. No waiting in long security check lines for this guy. Wait a second, why is the pre-check line blocked off? No, there's no pre-check available at this airport? The businessman lets out a heavy sigh, pinching the bridge of his nose for a moment as he gathers his thoughts. This is fine. This is fine. It's a pre-check. You just go through the regular security line. That tells you how much I get on a plane. But like I said, I don't like getting on planes to begin with. Time. What's the worst that could happen? It's not like he's running late. He's got plenty of time to make the flight, watch a few bad movies, get some sleep, and wake up on the other side of the world. Resigned to his fate, the businessman joins the security check line for ordinary Joes who didn't bother to spring for pre-check. This is fine. This is fine. The day is still going mostly according to plan or so he thinks. As the line inches along, the businessman spots more trouble up ahead. Oh, great. They're putting in a new body scanner right now. He can yep, see the metal detector. engineer, whatever the title is, finishing the setup. No wonder the line is so long. This is the cherry on top of a deeply irritating Sunday. But it's too late to turn back now, not without risking his promotion or even his job. Better just try to shrug it off and keep going. Maybe he'll get a candy bar when he reaches his gate. A little treat always helps ease the stress of travel. The line is moving at a steadier pace now, and the businessman can feel the tension in his chest easing up, his muscles loosening. Here we go. This is more like it. He slips his shoes off and holds them in his hands, standing in line in his socks. He might look a little silly, but it's the most efficient way to get through security. After what feels like an eternity, it's his turn to go through the security checkpoint. With a self-satisfied smile, he places his shoes in a bin next to his carry-on bag and drops them both on the conveyor belt. One of the TSA agents waves him on, beckoning him to step into the body scanner. He assumes the position, hands over his head, and waits for the queue to step through to the other side. But the queue doesn't come. The TSA agent holds up a hand, gesturing for the businessman to stay where he is. He tries to ask about what could be causing the holdup, but no one answers him. Must be a malfunction with the machine. 
perfect. He lets out another heavy sigh. Then, just behind his right ear, he hears a voice. Rough day, buddy. The businessman glances over his shoulder, expecting to see a TSA agent standing there. But there's no one. Has the stress of the worst okay, day he's go. ever had at the airport driven him to hallucinate? He hears it again. Hey, buddy, you there? Sounds like a rough day. Um, maybe there's a speaker embedded in the scanner somewhere for some reason. Just been kind of stressful. I'll feel better when I get on my flight. Oh, you're traveling. This fun, this fun. Where to? Australia. It's for this work thing. I'm not especially excited about it, but the boss will love it, so... Ha! <laughs> I heard that, my friend. Say, could you do me a favor? Um, I guess so. Could you tell me where I am? I just woke up and I can't see anything. Can't really feel anything either. It's all just darkness. It's kind of freaking me out here. The businessman scans the area, but no one appears to be paying attention. No one seems so he's to the hear only the one voice. that can hear it. Is that because it's lost in the din of airport chatter? Or because it's all in his head? We're at the airport. Airport? How do I get to the airport? Listen, buddy. I need you to help get me out of here. My wife and my daughter, they'll be looking for me. I don't know how long I've been gone. I need to get home. Can you help me? Privately, the businessman thinks that he really doesn't have time for this. But out loud, he says... Sure. It's just that I don't really know where you actually are, or how you're talking to me through this scanner thing. What do you mean? I'm right here. I'm talking out of my mouth. I'm not... What the hell are you talking about? The businessman is beginning to lose his patience. Something <laughs> about the situation well. is just not right. No one should be talking to him through the broken security scanner. The TSA should be letting him through, and he should be sitting at his gate right now. His built-up grievances spill out through his mouth. I don't have time for this. He shouts. A TSA agent turns to look at him. I promise, sir, we're working to fix the issue as fast as we can. There's no need to shout, she says. The voice in the scanner was speaking in a hushed tone before, a conspiratorial whisper. But now, it's growing louder, more desperate. You gotta help me, please. My family, I need to get to my family. Why can't I see? Why can't I move? It hurts. It hurts. Don't you understand, you idiot? It hurts. These words are shouted directly into the businessman's ear. Stop! Just stop! Stop yelling at me! Several TSA agents rush over to inspect the businessman, steadying him and gently guiding his hands away from his ears. They ask him if he's feeling all right, if they need to call someone for him. The businessman snaps, shouting that the scanner is broken, and he can hear a voice inside and something is very, very wrong. Well, unfortunately for the businessman, he looks more than a little suspicious now, and one security officer pulls him aside, leading him to a small nearby room for a chat. All the while, the businessman insists that the scanner was talking to him and that he's not crazy. He won't be leaving that interrogation room anytime soon. Unfortunately for the businessman, he will not be making that flight to Australia. And he's not getting his promotion. Meanwhile, the scanner is causing interference with the other technology at the checkpoint. The agents are scrambling to solve the problem, to keep the line moving while their colleague addresses an apparent mental health crisis nearby. The line keeps moving and more impatient passengers walk through the scanner. Just like the businessman before them, they can hear that voice, whispering hushed pleas that turn into anguished shouts. The same male voice, over and over again, begging for answers, begging for help. Someone deeply distressed is speaking through the scanner, and no one can figure out why. One elderly woman breaks down in tears as the voice angrily swears at her. A little girl screams in terror at the sudden sound. A man tries to argue with the voice, the two shouting over each other with increasing fervor. Soon, How come nobody else hears it? loud enough that the TSA agents can't ignore it. Much to the dismay of the passengers that haven't made it through yet, they close down the line. Slowly, one TSA agent approaches the scanner. Hello? She calls out. She feels silly doing it. There's no way someone is using the scanner as a communication device. The technology doesn't work like that. But then, clear as a bell, she hears the response. Hello? Are you going to help me? We're going to need to keep screaming for someone to listen. No doubt about it, that is a person, <laughs> a very distressed person. How are you speaking to me right now, sir? With my mouth. What are you, stupid? I don't want any trouble. Please, just let me go or I'm going to lose it. I just want to go home. What is this, some kind of kidnapping thing? Did you drug me? Sir, please, we can't help you if you don't tell us how you're speaking through the machine. There's no goddamn machine. That's just me. Just me. Me. The voice begins to sob in frustration, and the TSA agent feels a sudden wave of inexplicable nausea sweep through her body. There's no what? speaker on the machine, nowhere for a voice to emanate from. 
Why is she getting one nausea? solution in sight. They need to take this thing apart. Something is very, very wrong with it. She calls over several of her colleagues, and they begin to fiddle with the machine's outer shell, attempting to loosen and remove it. As they do, a blood-curdling scream rips through the air. Stop! Please, stop! Whatever you want, I'll do it. Just stop, please! She signals for the others to stop what they're doing, and the screaming ceases. When the voice speaks again, it sounds defeated, exhausted. What do you want from me? Is it money? I don't have much, but... If you let me go, I'll give you whatever I can. Please. My daughter just turned five. I just want to see her again. There was the sound of sobbing again. Somehow, when they tried to open the machine, it hurt the man speaking through it. This just gets weirder and weirder. Meanwhile, the interrogator in the nearby room receives word that the businessman is not, in fact, having a mental health crisis. He really did hear someone speaking through the scanner, someone that everyone can now hear. Whoever this mysterious man is, he will not listen to anyone, will not explain where he is or how he got there. He claims that he was having an ordinary day, lost consciousness, and woke up in total darkness. By the time the businessman is released, however, he has already missed his flight to Australia. That does it. That's the straw that breaks the camel's back. He marches back over to the body uh -oh, scanner, here we shoving go. TSA agents out of the way as he goes. He begins kicking at the scanner, shouting a stream of curses and epithets at the one who caused him to miss his very important flight, the one who may have cost him his promotion. Man or machine, it doesn't matter. This thing is his enemy now. The disembodied voice returns the shouts in kind, warning the businessman to back off, or you may not like what comes next. What I'm can warning they do? You. <laughs> the businessman laughs derisively, egging on the voice inside the scanner. Oh yeah, what are you gonna do? The businessman soon gets his answer, though he won't live to understand what it meant. As the voice screams, louder than anyone has heard it be so far, the businessman collapses to the ground. His body convulses, Whoa. and his eyes roll back. A seizure. The TSA agents attempt to interfere, but as they approach the scanner, they too collapse to the ground. Some are seizing, others are just unconscious. They don't know it, but all of them are suffering from extreme radiation poisoning. Oh. A crowd of passengers waiting to go through security breaks apart, people scattering every which way in search of help or a quick exit. In the next 48 hours, everyone who collapsed will be dead. After two more oh, weeks, shit. several of the bystanders will be dead too, all because of the one faulty scanner and the strange voice speaking from inside. Before the story can make the news, it is suppressed by SCP Foundation agents embedded in the media. All living witnesses are given amnestics, and the airport is temporarily closed. The cover story is an attempted terrorist attack, and people are... But how is this, is the body scanner alive? That, like, I don't, that doesn't make any sense, unless the, the guy died and was reincarnated as a body scanner. I mean, God knows, it's being run to the ground in anime right now. That idea. are all too quick to eat it up. No one will ever know the truth of what happened or the nature of the device that would become known as SCP-1966. SCP-1966 is a backscatter x-ray device built by a redacted engineering group sometime in the 2000s. It is approximately three meters by four meters by four meters in size. It was purchased by the American Transportation Security Administration for use in an international airport. Passive scans of SCP-1966 reveal no discernible difference between the internal structure of this scanner and other body scanners with the same design. However, it is no ordinary scanner. Shortly after the scanner was placed in its designated airport, it began to emit the sound of a human male voice. So far, the Foundation has been unable to determine where the voice originates from within the structure of the scanner. The voice responds to speech and other auditory stimuli in the vicinity of SCP-1966 and appears to belong to a sentient consciousness that resides within the scanner. It will continue to speak whether or not it is connected to a power source. In conversations with Foundation staff, SCP-1966 has claimed to be an insurance salesman from London, Ontario, by the name of Mr. J. It remembers being at its daughter's fifth birthday party, which, coincidentally, occurred the day before the scanner was placed at the airport. After the party, it reports becoming blind and unconscious. According to SCP-1966, it cannot see or experience any other senses other than hearing, the feeling of pain when the scanner is tampered with, and a sense of vibrations in the vicinity. Okay. It also appears to know when it is being moved and when someone is attempting to open its outer casing. When the casing is interfered with, it tends to respond by saying, Ouch! 
and stop that. In terms of the tone of conversation, <laughs> SCP-1966 can be friendly, or it can be angry to the point of being verbally abusive. Whenever SCP-1966 becomes especially upset, it begins to emit a higher level of ionizing radiation, with levels sometimes spiking to the point of causing immediate fatalities, as well as delayed deaths that occur within two weeks of exposure. In order to minimize casualties, it is important that SCP-1966 be kept calm. To this end, Protocol Psi-1966-A was developed. This protocol set a series of rules for Foundation staff to keep in mind while interacting with SCP-1966. First, the entity must always be referred to by the name it gave, Mr. J. Okay. If SCP-1966 like makes- Whoops, like 105, you gotta keep calling her Iris or she won't cooperate. Any claims about its memories or identity, they must be accepted without argument or contradiction. Personnel should never reference the Foundation, SCP-1966's current form, its acquisition and history, or where it is being contained. If SCP-1966 expresses any self-destructive urges or sentiments, the on-site director must immediately be notified. Junior staff are not considered qualified to handle this scenario, and swift so intervention senior is necessary are to prevent any needless radiation okay. poisoning or casualties. If SCP-1966 asks where it is, or expresses concern about its environment, it should be told that it is currently in the long-term care ward of a Toronto hospital, and that it suffered brain trauma during a car accident. If it asks to speak to its wife or daughter, the only approved response is, you know you can't talk to them now. This is in reference to the cover story provided to SCP-1966, which is that its wife and daughter died in the same car accident. However, Stating this plainly will exacerbate the entity's stress levels and may prove dangerous, so a gentle reminder and correction is preferable. Approximately a year right. after bringing SCP-1966 into custody, the Foundation tracked down a Mr. J, a London, Ontario-based insurance salesman with a wife and daughter. When interviewed under the guise of a survey, his memories and opinions matched those of SCP-1966 up until huh. the date it was first placed in the airport. He was then observed for three years. So it's like a, his consciousness was copied and it just somehow ended up in the body scanner. I thought he went into like one, another one of those anime reincarnated scenarios because God knows that idea is being run into the ground. I mean, for God's sakes, we have an anime where a guy's been reincarnated into a fridge. A fridge. Are you kidding me? <laughs> but nothing anomalous about the man was ever detected. For all intents and purposes, he is a perfectly ordinary, unexceptional man. The most unusual thing about Mr. J is that he has, as far as the Foundation can ascertain, never had contact with SCP-1966. In fact, he has never even set foot in the airport where SCP-1966 was previously in use. Somehow, SCP-1966 has developed an imprint of Mr. J's consciousness, but how exactly that occurred is beyond my understanding. SCP-1966 must be kept in a dedicated bunker two kilometers underground. The bunker must have right, 10 so meter thick reinforced anyone. concrete walls with an additional one meter of radiation shielding in order to prevent any radiation from leaking into the surrounding environment. To further reduce this risk, the location of its bunker must be at least 100 kilometers away from any major cities or population dense areas, as well as foundation sites. The current location of SCP-1966's bunker is classified and provided only to those who have received special clearance. The okay. monitoring station for SCP-1966 must be permanently manned by at least five Foundation staff with level two clearance or higher. Oh, I thought there'd been a lot, the a lot higher. Director for the, the bunker must level. have level four clearance and be a certified psychologist. No one may interact with SCP-1966 without the approval of this on-site director, and any interaction with SCP-1966 must conform to Protocol Psi-1966-A. The tale of SCP-1966 has been difficult for me to shake. It is far from the most bizarre anomaly I've researched, or the most dangerous, but it's there more is of like a the sad tragedy case. to it. Yeah. A machine, built only to assist with airport security, found itself suddenly cursed with a consciousness that was not its own. Nothing in the world will convince SCP-1966 that it is not a Canadian family man. Its mind is always occupied by thoughts and memories of a life it will never be able to live. A life that, no matter how real and personal it feels, never belonged to it in the first place. 
can any of us be certain we are not suffering from the same folly? How can we be sure that our memories, our names, our very identities are our own? The notion of self is a fragile thing, and SCP-1966 serves as an unsettling reminder that, no matter how secure we feel about who we are, outside observers may be able to see truths about us that we can never hope to comprehend. I never expected to feel quite so existential over an x-ray scanner. So, that kind of went the way I was expecting it to, because it literally was just a, a sentient body scanner. But I, for some reason, in the beginning of this video, I had doubts that that was where this was going to lead. Because, like I said at the beginning of this video, some of the SCPs that have certain titles do not directly correlate to what we're going to be seeing in the video. I mean, just, what is the one I could think of? I think there was a junior high school one I thought this all a while back I might have seen it I don't remember it's been a little too while, too long and I can't keep track of every single SCP video I make that's why I have a playlist so I can just scroll through it and see what I have reacted to and what I haven't um but either way it this SCP is more like a tragic tale like somebody's consciousness was copied and just placed in something for no apparent reason. So makes me uh, sympathize with this SCP. But if you guys enjoyed today's SCP reaction video, please like, comment, and subscribe. And I will see you all in the next reaction video. Bye.